Um, so today's discussion is part of a two-lecture discussion about energy resources in the environment. And today's topic, that will do some general discussion about what that means, that follows um, along with what is described in the text. Then we'll talk about fossil fuels, and then next time we'll talk about non-fossil fuels. So in many ways, the discussion today follows on what we talked about um, last time. And there are some reading to do. Um, chapter 17, Green Chemistry and Industrial Ecology. And then there are also, if this is optional, but if you're interested, Chapter 18. Neither of those are particularly long chapters, but that's on um, resources and sustainable materials. So as I say, today we're going to talk about general considerations for energy resources in the environment. And we'll talk about carbon-based fuels and a couple of types, fossil fuels, which are divided into different subcategories like coal and oil and methane. And then we'll separately talk about methane hydrates. And next time we'll go on to non-carbon fuels. So, you know, mo most of this stuff is fairly intuitive when you read in the text about mineral resources. And, and these are things I think you're all concepts that you're familiar with. What I'm going to do is focus on the energy aspects because it kind of follows on what we talked about last time. There's a lot of stuff in the text about how minerals are also important resources and different types of utilization and extraction and then the benefits or deficits from a cost and an environmental perspective of doing things like recycling um, versus getting new deposits out of the ground. And, and some of the geopolitical context isn't in there, but I think this is Stuff that if you follow the news, you're kind of familiar with that um, in some ways, different countries' sort of demands for resources and um, looking for them in other places beyond their boundaries cause a lot of what um, are considered the major world conflicts. Today. You, could, you could add into here water as another one of these resources. So I think this is statement is pretty obvious, but I just want to kind of remind everyone that humans, especially since the start of the Industrial Revolution, but even before that, you know, going back to when we started, for instance, to have the Bronze Age, we've made really dramatic changes into how the geosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere function through our extraction of resource materials. Various kinds of contaminants are released in the environment. And, um, and that's, there's a legacy of that, and that's getting more intense, even as we become more aware of some of the issues. This is from a paper from 2016. This starts in the 1800s, you know, sort of the start of the Industrial Revolution, and goes through, I don't know, whatever that is, like 2120. So obviously projection, everything past this, um, I think this line is meant to be 2016 when the paper was published. But anyway, 2016, somewhere in there. And you can see there's been this change that sort of early on, it was a lot of wood, wood burned really pretty dirty, but it's a fairly renewable resource, as we'll see. Then we transitioned in this time when we started using a lot of coal. And you can see here that in this projection, in this paper, coal goes on well past the year 2100. We'll look in a moment at some earlier projections made back in the 80s where everyone was pretty sure, oh, no, nah, nah, we'll be off coal, partly because of global warming and partly because it's such a dirty fuel. And then later in the sort of mid-century 1900s, we started to go into oil. Then oil became a really big thing. And this chart again predicts oil continuing well past the end of the century with all the ramifications that we discussed last time for global warming. Then there's this big thing about natural gas. This is the thing that's the most different from the predictions made in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s when people thought we were going to run out of gas. And that's because of new development of new technologies. But because of the world energy demand, if you look at the sum curve that goes through here, it goes through some peaks. And you can see here that starting sort of, you know, whatever, 10 years ago or so and going up into the future by about 2060 or so, it's expected that the world energy demand is going to go up by a lot, right? From something like 120 or so um, in these units up to maybe 200, almost double. And so the presumption is, is that even with all of these things and, and these uh, most generous predictions about utilizing these things, that there needs to be some new energy sources. What you don't see on this plot is nuclear, which you used to see as the dominant form of energy back in the 70s and 80s. 
the oil companies and pretty much anyone involved in energy was aware of global warming. They were making plans for a transition to nuclear. Um, and I still think nuclear should be part, part of our future, but um, for various reasons, mostly sociological and political and to a much lesser extent safety, um, nuclear has been pulled out of this mix. But we'll look at some plots that, that don't show that um, you know, from the past. So these are three kinds of resources that, um, that we have. Things that, that we extract that we take out of the earth, things that are renewable, these are things that are regenerated on human time scales. Uh, this is a sliding scale to what renewable actually means, but it is a little bit different from a society to society basis. But we're talking about things that can be generated and reused relatively quickly. Things like light from the sun, wind energy, uh, to some extent, trees in a forest. And then we have stored energy. And this has become really important in the last years. I mean, anyone who has a battery powered car, or a unit in their home with solar that converts that into backed up um, energy so that you can have energy on demand, even though that resource isn't making energy like at night, has become more and more important. This has always been part of our energy mix. You think about you know, flashlights and portable radios, et cetera. But as I say, in the last five to 10 years, it's become very important, especially because the material science technology has improved. And we'll talk a little bit about batteries next. So these are all the types of the energy. And again, I think these are all things that are fairly intuitive to you. Thermal energy, chemical energy, electrical energy, kinetic energy, mechanical energy, radiant energy, nuclear energy, and potential energy. And there, each one of these are defined as you know how they are generated how they are utilized is different for each one of these things with different efficiencies, how easy they are to generate, the cost per kilowatt hour, however you want to think about it, um, is very different for each of these. But in some cases, some types of energy are the type that needs to be applied there because other types simply don't exist or are not feasible. There's also different sources that are used for different purposes, right? Like um, thermal energy is used for heating and cooking. Um, but it's not so useful for running your car, for instance, that's chemical energy. And so one of the important things to note is that oftentimes as a society, we will generate energy in various ways, transform it into other kinds, maybe even store it and then deliver it to customers. And when we transfer between one type of energy to another, um, we can lose something like 40 to 90% of that energy. Some, not all transformations are that bad, but many of them are, so that we're basically generating energy and then we're losing a lot of it during the transformation. And this diagram from your text kind of shows that. It's got those same uh, list of energy types. And then you can see these percents are the amount of energy that's lost during the transformation. So you can see here, um, um, th this is, I'm pretty sure these are, uh, yeah, these are efficiency of conversion meaning the amount that's lost is 100 minus that. So for instance, a thermocouple, which is not really important for um, making energy in spacecraft, for instance, they don't have to be very efficient because they just need a little bit of energy to keep things warm, to keep things running, but they don't make a lot of energy. And most of the energy when it's converted to electricity is lost. You can see that like an electric motor, um, like you might find in an automobile, when it converts that electrical energy into mechanical energy to make the car be able to go, that can be 60 to 90% efficient. Electrical generators can be 90% efficient. So not all of these things have major losses to them, but you can see a lot of numbers in here are well less than 50%. Even things like photosynthesis, it's not a very efficient process. It's just like we got a lot of it, right? There's a lot of photosynthesizing organisms on the planet. Collectively, they account for a lot of energy transfer. So this is a diagram that basically shows us something about the amount of energy that is lost, or what's called rejected energy in this particular diagram. This is from 2018. So it's got, the, the categories are divided up a little bit differently. All of these things, this, these are showing green, petroleum, biomass, coal, natural gas, these are all fossil fuels, okay? And then this stuff up here is non-fossil fuels. So you can see by the size of the box and the number there, the sort of mix uh, in the United States, it's just for the US in 2018. Um, and the, you know, these are here, they're present, but they're still a much smaller than half of the mix. And then what you see is 
from each one of these things, there's two arrow or two, whatever you want to call it, flow lines, the amount that goes, um, well, they, they go to these various uses, transportation, industrial, commercial, and then residential, and then they bifurcate into two different colors. The colors being the amount that is utilizable, in gray or in darker gray, I guess, and the amount that is rejected or wasted in lighter gray. And you can see in aggregate in the United States, two thirds of the energy that's generated is wasted. Okay, so this is there's lots of reasons for this. Um, it's not like uh, it's not that they purposely it costs you know people who generate energy money to generate energy, and they'd like to improve this if they could. But this is stuff like transmission lines that leak, storage capabilities that leak. Um, in some cases, the transport of energy, which involves quote unquote leakage because of mechanical dissipation, frictional heat, that kind of stuff. But there's obviously a lot of headway. And if, we're, if the world is going to start using something like twice as much energy as it does now in the next 50 years, it really needs to address that problem. Or else it's going to have to just find even more and more sources of energy than we know are readily available. So this slide kind of describes what renewable energy is. I, again, I think this is something that you're pretty, um, you know, it, most people are pretty informed about at some level, but it's actually a really ambiguous term because what do we mean by renewable depends a lot on the time scales and the impacts of running that industry. So many people think that biomass, like burning trees, making uh, wood that can then be burned in stoves or um, other, you know, kinds of things like that, or generating steam from steam turbines. It's, it's an easy resource to grow and to utilize. And you can find some varieties of trees that grow pretty quickly. But if you were to try and provide for most of the energy for even a small size country using biomass, you would have to cultivate large areas of the landscape. There would be impacts on forested ecosystems, soil erosion, the amount of nutrients that you need to put into the environment, etc. And so, um, on a small scale, it can be thought of as renewable, but on a large scale, it's an example of something that's like, eh, maybe. <clears throat> so here's some um, a slide that shows you a variety of what are considered the traditional renewable resources, biomass being the one described on the last slide, geothermal, which is extraction of heat from underneath the ground, hydroelectric, which, you know, taking uh, water behind dams and converting the potential energy to sort of water, um, by running it through a turbine um, into mechanical energy and electrical energy, solar energy, and wind energy. And these are becoming more important and more utilized. Um, Hawaii doesn't have much geothermal, even though we have a lot of um, potential. And this is largely because of um, cultural uh, ideas about Pele and um, upsetting her and other Hawaiian guys. At least that's been the main reason put forth. There are other political reasons as well. Hydroelectric is really not practical here. Uh, we've never really been big on biomass uh, because it's just not really an effective renewable resource for us, although there have been some utilization of obtaining fields to make ethanol. Wind and solar are, of course, both big here. And anyone who's seen a wind or a solar installation of any size knows that they're really ugly, right? They're, they're, yeah, they do the job and they do the job very cleanly, but they're certainly not pretty to look at and in a place that, you know, where tourism is so important. Um, that's not often a good thing. What's not listed on here are various kinds of ocean energy conversion, tide conversion, wave conversion, which are also becoming more important. These are topics, we'll talk about these next time, but I did, you can see some of the countries that are considered leaders in these things and other parts of the country, especially in the West, Geothermal, which is geothermal is important and hydroelectric is important, although hydroelectric has become less important than it was 100 years ago. So on a national scale, this is from a government website. This is sort of how we in the US utilize energy. You can see here that petroleum is something like about 40% of the mix. Natural gas, which is separated out, is another 23, and coal is another 23. Right. So when we put these three things together, hydrocarbon resources that generate carbon dioxide that contribute to greenhouse warming, you can see it's the lion's share of the mix, right? The only thing that we've got like 8% here of nuclear, 8% of renewable, then like 16%. So 84% today of our energy utilization is um, 
hydrocarbon base and it's putting CO2 into the atmosphere. This is how this kind of renewable breaks up in the sort of hydroelectric biomass, solar, geothermal. And these numbers are getting bigger at the expenses of this and this, but probably not fast enough. So you can also look at energy utilization. You know, people always talk about this in sort of generic sense that like, oh, the United States population uses way more resources than the average human on the globe. And when it comes to energy, that's kind of true. So this is the amount of energy that you will expend living day to day, just, you know, not running into your devices, but just being a human being. Now, if you look at the per capita, meaning per person in the population, energy utilization in the U.S., and Canada is 8,000 watts a day. In other industrial countries like parts of um, Europe and China, um, 3,000 to 5,000, and then less than 3,000 in non industrial countries. So it's still a lot, even these, but obviously the people in North America are using something like twice their share um, on average compared to even other industrialized countries. And part of that is due to this waste and the vastness of the, I mean, these are large countries. You have to transmit power over large areas, and there is some loss from that, but um, it's pretty clear that with energy efficient improvements and reducing that amount of rejected energy, um, we could do a lot to increase the amount of energy that we have available without having to change the amount per capita of consumption. So there are three main categories of energy usage, domestic, industrial, and transportation. And in industrial, people usually include agriculture as well as, you know, like smokestack industries and so-called clean industries like, um, you know, pharmaceuticals and clothing, and electronics and biomedical and so forth. But it turns out that for most average humans in the U.S., transportation is the lion's share of our energy utilization. So now let's look back to this. You can see here copyright 1999. So this is like um, you know, whatever that is, 20 something years ago, quarter century ago or so, is a similar plot to the plot that we looked at that went to the year 2100. But you'll see some differences. You'll see that this shows energy utilization through, you know, like 1985 or so, um, or maybe 1990, I don't know where it cuts off exactly, uh, increasing for all types that were common in the mix. Uh, you'll see nuclear in there, which we didn't see in that later chart. You'll see hydroelectric actually growing. You'll see coal growing. It's bigger here than it is here, for instance. Gas growing, oil uh, maybe growing, it may be stabilizing at sort of 1975 values or so. And so you can ask yourself, well, why, why didn't we come to this future? And how different is our future from these projections? Some of these things aren't that dissimilar, but in this same um, presentation, they made approximations of, oh, well, what do we think it's going to be like in the year 2100? And you'll see all these things reaching a peak around, you know, 2020 or so, or maybe 2030 for coal, and then going down, right? And these sort of non-fossil fuel sources um, increasing in demand scenarios are just the projection of what the world energy demand will be, which haven't changed by all that much. These are a little bit higher, these upper demand scenarios, a little bit higher than we saw on that other slide. This lower bound is closer to the demand scenario. And this sort of non-fossil fuel sources includes primarily nuclear. And there are some other things in there too, like hydroelectric. So just compare that to this, right? So this slide here has all of these types essentially declining significantly by the year 2100 with coal, coal's thickness of its band isn't really changing that much. Um, and you can see the increase in tar and oil shales, which has actually um, come true. These are types of petroleum deposits that are expensive to take out of the ground and dirty. They're only economically viable when the cost of oil goes up as it has. And so there's more and more of this being produced, especially in, for instance, countries like Canada. Um, but the key factors here are the complete decline of oil, you know, by whatever, 2060 or so, and gas following by the end of the century. That was the prediction back in, you know, the end of the last century, whereas now we see that that's not the case. We see, well, yeah, coal's going to keep on going, oil's going to keep on going, natural gas is going to keep on going. It might even grow. It's bigger here than it is here where we currently are, uh, or 2016 when this was written. 
And his renewable energy is still in here. It's not as big as it was on the other slide. But the reason for this has to do with a combination of how um, reserves of these things are reported by companies and countries, how we define reserves as being economically viable or not. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And um, sort of discovery of new resources. There's always new discoveries going on. And so, you know, people have been talking about something called peak oil, where we, the maximum amount of oil utilization in this country, and then we reach a peak and we go off. And that discussion started happening in the seventies and it was always a few decades off, but it's still a few decades off. So obviously to move that goalpost means that we have to be finding new discoveries. So this, I think it was an interesting um, assessment in the New York Times from a few years ago. Uh, these are just frame grabs I did on my phone. It was a, a story that basically said, well, what's the energy mix looking like in the US since the start of the century through the time that the article was written um, and color coded by kind of different types of energy which are up here in the category. So like that really ugly color is coal, orange is natural gas, nuclear is purple, blue is hydroelectric and petroleum is pink. And you can see that the mix across the whole country has had changed where coal became much less significant, natural gas became more significant. So cleaner burning in terms of things like mercury and CO and uh, sulfur into the atmosphere, maybe a little bit less CO2, not as much black carbon going in the atmosphere, but when natural gas burns, it still makes CO2. So it's not like we're reducing greenhouse gas. And unfortunately, in my opinion, a decline in nuclear, not a gigantic decline, but a little bit of a decline. Uh, hydroelectric being pretty steady. We're not really doing new hydroelectric, uh, but we're not really dismantling existing hydroelectric that goes back to the sort of 20s and 30s and 40s of last century. And then these other colors are just like tiny little ribbons. They also had plots where, okay, so we can look at the mix by state. Um, and so you can see which states do which things, right? There were a few natural gas states. Um, Hawaii is was pretty much the only place in the country, even at the turn of the century, that was making most of this uh, electricity from petroleum burn, primarily diesel fuel. Just think, we don't have any resource here, so all that stuff has to be brought in. Other places were, make some electricity that way, but not the majority of it. And we still make the majority of our electricity that way, although the mix has gotten a little bit better. And one could argue that's probably because HECO is a monopoly. They're the only energy generator in a state of substance, and they basically do what they want. Uh, you can see where hydroelectric kind of dominates um, and where, for instance, nuclear dominates in a few places. And that, that had increased the number of states that had nuclear had increased, um, but not substantially. Then there's also sort of individual states. So I've just got a few snapshots. I mean, you can look through the notes, the keys in more detail. You have to sort of think about them. I mean, Hawaii hasn't really changed all that much. You can see solar and wind kind of kicking up a little bit, you know. Um, sort of seven or eight years ago. And then you have places like, you know, California, it's mostly a natural gas state, but it's got some nuclear and it's got some uh, hydroelectric and they've been kind of slowly getting rid of their nuclear power plants in part because a lot of the power plants were uh, associated with places with earthquake hazards. So they probably weren't uh, good, great places to put them in the first place. There's New York. Um, you know, this mix looks pretty similar to California. Some mix of gas, hydroelectric, and nuclear are the top three things. But then look at some other states, like, you know, here we got Iowa and West Virginia. And so to some extent, when people look at the politics of the country, um, you have to realize that a lot of the politics in one place or another is governed by what the critical industries are in those states. And energy utilization is one of them. There's a reason why, you know, Manchin votes the way he does, even as a Democrat on energy and other related things, because that is basically the only place they get their power. And they've made no efforts to take advantage of some of these other things. I mean, we have solar and wind pretty much everywhere, even hydroelectric, which has, it's stable, it's got some um, availability here. Um, and even, you know, states like Iowa, yeah, they dabble in some other stuff, but not very much. Okay, so um, the text kind of goes through a bunch of detail about chemical fuels and nuclear fuels and solar fuels and kinetic fuels and heat fuels, like what they are, what the common resources in the United States, um, how they're utilized, 
And I'm not going to kind of talk about that in detail, but um, only to point out that electricity is the most versatile form of energy. So we pretty much, not 100%, but pretty much to a vast majority, take energy from these various sources and convert them into electricity, store them and deliver them to people. And that's the mostly the kind of energy that you use, except for in your car, when you're going around, if you saw the gas powered car, um, that's obviously, you know, taking chemical fuels and converting them into kinetic energy, but um, for the phone and, and pretty much everything else, you're using electricity. Now electricity is pretty much generated in one of these other ways and then converted into that and you should store um, for on-demand use. So this is this kind of a table of all the different kinds of energy and what and, and you know some of the details about them in terms of pluses and minuses. And the reason I put this together is because um, I wanted to point out which ones don't make greenhouse gases and which ones do make greenhouse gases. So that if you're one of the people that believes that global climate change induced by anthropogenic practices of loading of the atmosphere with greenhouse gases is a very important, if not the most important crisis facing the planet right now, then you would naturally gravitate to the forms of energy that don't add greenhouse gases when you're talking about new resource utilization. To some extent, it's very expensive to change existing infrastructure and existing practices. And for this country, and for many countries, they use a lot of these chemical fuels, primarily hydrocarbon-based, that emit greenhouse gases. And we're not going to dismantle that energy infrastructure until we can replace it with something else, as long as there's still demand. As long as the population wants to you know, power up their phones, they're going to keep generating that electricity. So we'll talk a little bit about fossil fuels, and we're going to divide this up into a few different um, categories. We'll talk about petroleum and coal and natural gas. Um, it's the major energy resource in the United States and in most places around the world. Um, it's pretty easy to get to extract out of the ground. So what it really is is, you know, when you think about the geosphere and the biosphere and how they interact, is fossilized portions of the biosphere that have been buried and transformed through diagenesis, slightly different processes for petroleum and oil, but heat and pressure transform what was past living material stored away so that it's not being reoxidized by respiration and being added to the atmospheric CO2 after it's being produced. It's stored away hundreds of millions of years of time. And then we come along and decide, ah, let's start pulling that out of the ground and using it. So really what we've done in terms of upsetting the balance of CO2 in the atmosphere is just accelerate the natural process through which buried carbon-rich rocks would be exhumed and weathered and CO2 would be produced by you know, many, many orders of magnitude. So I've never tried to do the calculation, but you know, uh, probably something close to a million times faster than it would naturally happen. So we want to talk a little bit about the different types of fossil fuels and the consumption and the production. And are we running out or not running out? And the answer is always sort of like, yeah, probably a few decades we're going to run out. And like I say, uh, back in the 70s, that gave people you know, a lot of hope back in the 70s and 80s. They're like, ah, this global warming thing's never going to happen because we're going to run out of carbon. But we haven't run out of carbon. And we just keep pumping it in the atmosphere. And those latest projections have us still doing that by the year 2100. So, and when we'll talk a little bit about IPCC projections, and it is um, easy for us to continue putting 10 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere every year using known existing reserves. So I think anyone who thinks that we're going to run out of carbon and that's going to get us out of the global warming problem is um, kind of diluted. It's just not going to happen. We have to actually employ technology and behavioral change to stop putting so much carbon in the atmosphere. So the interesting thing about, um, and the petroleum industry is, I mean, it's, it's heavily based in geology and engineering. They do a lot of really innovative stuff, innovative science, innovative Im imaging, um, beneath the subsurface in, uh, innovative chemistry. Um, and this is one of the reasons why they've been able to keep increasing the economic viability of many deposits that were discovered in the past, but were thought to not be um, viable. And that's part of what keeps exchange, extending this out. And it's not, you know, I don't want to say anything negative about that industry because you know, it's based on people and there's a lot of good science that goes on there. But globally, um, you know, as a community, if we want to mitigate climate change, then we have to stop using 
fossil fuels. So this is a chart from your textbook. This is an older version, so it had a different uh, chapter number, sort of showing you the relative sizes of resources as of the 70s, right? And the reason we say this is because in the 70s is when people in the petroleum industry started to say, oh, hmm, you know, um, we think we're going to run out of gas and oil and coal in the next few decades. And th that was the period of time when people started talking about this, not talking about global warming. And um, the relative sizes of the res res resources haven't changed, but the amount and the amount kind of remaining, if you will, um, has changed over time since then. But you can kind of see that coal and other coal-like deposits, something called lignite. And I'm going to show you a chart in a second that has all the definitions of coal. But there's stuff that's been more or less digenesized and has more or less energy, more or less contaminants in it, et cetera, et cetera. And the sort of whole combined pile is our biggest hydrocarbon resource, followed by oil and natural gas, which at this time were thought to be you know, two to one. Now, if you were to make the same chart, you put a higher amount here because we're utilizing forms of natural gas and more distributed that used to be thought of as not utilizable. And at the end, if we get to it today, we'll talk a little bit about methane hydrates, which takes this number and multiplies it by about 10. Uh, and then you can see where these tar sands are and where the shale oil. I mean, they're small compared to this over here, but they're not insignificant, right? They're, they're not a 0.5, so like 20% so <clears throat> now coal is the same and coals give names by a bunch of different categories mostly how wet is it and how much um, carbon content does it have which translates into how much heat can i generate from burning it and so there's the highest grade stuff is called anthracite that's the good stuff um, and the worst stuff is peat which isn't even really coal right it's just shallow not compressed Digenesize uh, um, in uh, anaerobic condition transformation. You find it in some swamps and so forth. It, so, really, going from lignite to bituminous to anthracite is basically the amount of heat and pressure the coal has experienced, which generally translates to depth in the earth. Uh, the cleaner it burns, the hotter it burns, the less water produces, and um, becomes lower and lower in sulfur and other contaminants. And the short story is that we've used up pretty much all the good stuff, right? The, that was, um, people were aware of this and they went for the stuff that town for town you get the most energy from. So this is like another look in more detail at different kinds of coal. So you see anthracite is divided up now into four categories. And so over here, you've got the percent of carbon in dry weight. And over here, you've got the amount of uh, energy you can generate from it. And lignite, which was that one that was off, off to the side. Now, peat, peat is not on this, this chart, but um, this goes from low numbers to high numbers. In case you're wondering, this goes from low numbers to high numbers. And it just sort of shows you um, that not all coal resources are the same. You can generate a lot more energy from some types than from other types. And as I say, those are the ones that tend to be cleaner. Um, and this is some sort of assessment of the relative amount of um, sort of carbon and moisture and volatiles and heat content that you can get from these different kinds of coals. I only point this out, as I say, to say that like if the, even though there's this huge coal resource out there, if it was mostly this stuff, pound for pound, we could take a lot less of it out of the ground. We could also put a lot less sulfur and a lot less mercury, a lot less arsenic and other heavy metals, a lot less black carbon into the atmosphere than if we're um, taking these lower grade qualities of coal, which are unfortunately the kinds that are mostly exploited nowadays. So um, now let's talk a little bit about petroleum. The, the coal is going to be existing long after we get our act together and stop using it. So we don't even really think about um, ever reaching the peak of coal. There's plenty of it out there. But you can look at petroleum consumption as a little bit different. So this is historical petroleum consumption from a US, um, you know, G USGS report around the turn of the century that sort of shows here's what the US was using, here's what the world was using. And the key thing, you've already seen that per capita assessment, you know that per person, the US uses a lot more than its share. But the, interestingly enough, the US energy consumption profile hasn't really changed all that much 
from 1970 to 2000, right? We're kind of using what we use, whereas other parts of the world are really increasing. And this is as standards of living increase in other countries, they become economically developed, they demand more energy, and energy has to come from somewhere. Now, more recent versions of these plots would show us growing a little bit more, but other countries have grown even more than that, especially China and, and uh, India. So the thing about oil and gas reserves are, as I mentioned before, the kind of short-term business forecasts. They're not really based on science, although there's science that goes into them, um, and they are subject to some kind of political wrangling in different countries. Some countries want to show that they have less than they actually have. Other countries want to pretend they have more than they do to leverage power or whatever. That's some of the Arabian states, for instance. But um, we have a kind of a quasi good idea. And I'll show you some uh, scientific assessments of that in a second. But I just wanted to first go through these definitions, which are discussed in the text, but not really shown graphically like this. You'll hear people talk about reserves known reserves, for instance, are things that have been identified that we know are there, proved or provable or indicated or inferred. You can see that the level of confidence goes down. Like we can infer, oh, this place looks like it's right. They still call that a reserve. Um, and what makes something a reserve versus a potential resource is that it's considered economically viable to take it out of the ground. And economically viable is also a sliding scale, right? Because that depends on the economy of the time. Then beyond that, we have resources, which is a much bigger box, but it includes things that are in all of these categories that are just too expensive, like maybe they're too deep, or they're out in the ocean in deep water, or they're in some extreme environment that um, we're just not sure we can get out. So there's a lot more of that, maybe twice as much in all these categories. Plus, there's just things over here, hypothetical. Like, oh, well, you know, they might be economically viable, but we're not sure that they're actually there, right? Uh, we're just going to put them into the resources. And then you get into these, this area of quote unquote additional occurrences, which are things that are both not economic and only speculated that they exist. But when people talk about how much carbon is there to utilize to load into the atmosphere, um, they're pretty much talking about the reserves and the resources. So, you know, the estimates of these things vary, uh, as I kind of mentioned. This is one set of estimates um, about the U.S. that um, around the turn of the, the century and sort of like different, um, you know, different types of reserves discovered but considered unrecoverable with current technology, probably like half. Uh, or so. And um, this is actually something that has gotten smaller because of technological developments to make it economically viable now to pull stuff out of the ground that, you know, 25 years ago we were saying, eh, it's not worth, worth our time and energy. Then there's the amount that we actually produce. And then there's all this, this sort of other slice of the pie, which is the sort of various categories of reserves that are either um, hypothetical or um, kind of you know, proved or hypothesized and recoverable or not using current technology. And these slices of the pie are the things that like, you can apply technology to to maybe in the future start to recover. And this is a global assessment done by scientists at the USGS in about the year 2000. These colors are just different kinds of resources. Um, in different regions of the world, kind of like, well, how much do we think each of the country has rather than relying on the production estimates? And you can see what the numbers are here and who has the most oil in terms of, you know, either these absolute amounts or the percent of the world total. So this is oil and then this is natural gas over here. Um, and you can see that when it comes to oil, the former Soviet Union and the Middle East have a lot. And then South America, Central South America have next most, and pretty much all the other regions where most of the oil is being used have a lot less. On natural gas, it's a little bit more evenly distributed, but the same three regions have the most, right? And this is a lot of what drives politics in the world and why countries make friends with other countries, even though their governments aren't particularly stable and very nice to their people, it's in part so they can get access to these energy resources. 
So using these numbers, uh, they calculated using the current consumption rate in the year 2000, that was about 40 years of oil left in that report. This is like another assessment from the US Department of Energy from around the same time, just one year later, looking at sort of the amount in reserve, the amount that's being produced and the amount that's being consumed. And so you can see the situation in the US, we're consuming a lot more than we're producing and that we still have in the ground. OPEC is the opposite situation. The rest of the world looks kind of like the US, but just magnifies. So there are certain parts of the world that have more oil than others, and certain parts of the world are consuming more oil than others. Using these estimates, which were slightly different, you can calculate, again, something, they were more like uh, 30 years of oil left in the year 2008. So 30 years, 40 years, it's, it's multiple decades. And this is basically these um, reserves keep moving forward in time. So the box of known reserves, which we would say, oh, there's like 30 years or 40 years or whatever, is um, constantly growing because of discoveries and constantly shrinking because of consumption. And yet, for some strange reason, this box has always stayed at something like 30 or 40 years, even since people first started talking about peak oil in the 70s. So you can basically surmise from this that there's enough oil and petroleum to keep loading. We're not talking about coal now to keep loading the atmosphere with the amount that we need. So this is a slide I showed you last time. These were different. These are different carbon loading scenarios, taking us out to the year 2300, assuming a net flux of about 10 gigatons of carbon per year, which is the year 2000 levels. So if you remember, we talked about the historical levels up through the start of the Industrial Revolution until about the year 1990, that was six gigatons per year, right? And then by the year 2000, we've gotten to 10 gigatons per year. People were saying, oh man, if we could just go back to the 1990 levels, everything will be okay. Well, we've well surpassed the 2000. I don't think we can even get back to 10 gigatons per year. But so you can ask the question, so do we have enough carbon to keep loading the atmosphere Set for 10 gigatons of carbon per year out to all these years. The main difference between these two scenarios, you can see here, this one here, this red level has a constant CO2 emission. Like we keep using the same amount. We don't increase it with energy utilization, but um, we don't do anything to curtail it. This one here, which is oftentimes considered the business as usual pathway, means eh, just willy nilly use all the carbon, but then eventually things are going to get so bad that the amount of carbon will stop. But what's interesting is if you look at the total carbon concentration in the atmosphere, while well, this one produces less carbon than this one, the temperature effect is basically the same at the year 2300. You follow different pathways, but you basically get to the same cumulative temperature. And so you can look at in, that was from the 2001 synthesis report from the IPCC. And this is, you know, a diagram that sort of, says, um, well, how much known oil, gas, and coal do we have, and can we sustain 10 gigatons per year if that's what um, you know, people assume um, is going to happen? And you can see these are in thousands of gigatons of carbon, uh, the amount that's still available. These are various kinds of utilization scenarios and stabilization scenarios. And the bottom line is that there's way more carbon still out there to be used than um, you know, would be needed to sustain either of those two pathways. So um, you know, in the year 2000 assessment from the USGS, they said, well, we had 266 gigatons of carbon um, as petroleum, another 230 is natural gas. And that when we add those things together, it makes 500 gigatons of carbon. And so as you can see, that's like 50 years producing 10 gigatons of carbon. And so, you know, from this estimate, you, and you might say, oh, well, we would finish using all of our petroleum if we're talking about the sort of the world endowment by about the year 2050, which now I think people think is unrealistic because the reserve numbers have gone up. So um, this is like for the United States, the oil reserve. This is kind of, an, you know, people, like I said, used to talk a lot about peak oil. And this is the plot that they would use to um, discuss peak oil, which is 
Um, in red is the amount of production, and we had our peak in the United States in around 1975-ish or so. And this is the discoveries, right? And that's sort of tailing off. And of course, in the US, we don't only consume the oil that we produce in the US, but through enhanced recovery techniques and um, various other kind of technological improvements, we've been actually able to really change the shape of this curve from what they predicted back, you know, in the in the 70s or 80s. And interestingly enough here, you can also calculate like there was a time lag of about four years between the peak in discovery, which at this time was in the 30s, and the peak of utilization, which was in the 70s, which is like this number keeps coming up, you know, 30, 40 years, even back back then when we didn't have, you know, great knowledge about the things that were to come. So in the USGS estimates of that document, they also talk about, well, what do we think of possible scenarios for reserves around the world that we've yet to um, define, the sort of more hypothetical ones? They had a couple of different scenarios. One was like, ah, we're just going to continue with the curve as we thought it was going to be somewhere. Ah, we're just going to basically take the average of the last decade and shoot it out and with some enhanced recovery. And another one, which was sort of, um, I don't know, like, oh, we're going to discover a whole bunch of new stuff. And so, you know, they have kind of growth models of reserves up to something like 100% which just adds to the uncertainty um, at the time of you know, what is possible with respect to how, when are we gonna run out of oil? But the conclusion that most people would make is that, well, we're just not gonna run out of oil for a while and that's not gonna limit. So then you can ask about natural gas. <clears throat> so basically this is a similar kind of curve. This is showing us the amount of natural gas utilized per year, starting out I think in 15, going to 2100. And um, so these are reserves and these are the amount that's pulled out of the ground. You can see that those are all increasing. And this was right before the advent of what we call enhanced recovery techniques, such as fracking. This is already growing, already becoming a more important part of the mix as petroleum is coming less. You see the gas was considered kind of like uh, not, not that useful, especially because of the expense of transporting it around and so forth. But in many oil refineries, even today, the natural gas that comes off of the oil is burned off. That's what all those smokestacks are. So <clears throat> this was um, you know, from uh, another report in 2006 from another source, sort of looking at consumption and production of natural gas and sort of um, same thing as oil, right? Like consumption is kind of coming up and leveling off and at some point it's going to decline. This is again right before fracking and so forth. And the consumption is much higher. So we're raising the alarm, kind of like with peak oil, like, oh, yeah, we're running out of gas and we better fix our energy um, utilization scenarios because um, we just don't have enough reserves to supply the gas, which isn't quite true. So this is another, um, kind of look at that, and what's been added to this is this green curve, which is unconventional fracking and um, recovery of methane from resources that were previously considered to be unutilizable. So while the sort of conventional stuff um, was starting to decline, the unconventional stuff is starting to increase and could probably increase even more if they wanted to. The only thing I, I also want to point out is this blue curve which is the gas usage. I basically shifted it by 23 years just to make it overlap with this so you can see it's the same shape. The blue curve is actually back over here, right? So just like the, the oil curve, which has got like a 30 or 40 year offset between discoveries and utilization, uh, this one's got like a 23 year offset. So similar time scale. And this is just another plot sort of showing you, this is from that 2016 paper and a couple of these other things have come from the sort of predictions over, I know it's a little bit hard to read, it was a small figure and I blew it up a lot, but this is the year 2200. And so uh, that's like 1980, that's 2060. Like I said, I know it's hard to read, that's the year 2000 right here. But so in this one, you know, they basically made their assessment that Oh, you know, oil will be sort of gone by the year 2200. There'll still be some natural gas, but we'll be way off the peak. But I, I think in this assessment, um, 
you know, we're still looking at well over 100 years, almost 200 years after, you know, like whatever 200 minus 16 is 184 years of plenty of stuff, which supports kind of what the IPCC was saying. So I think even if you take the most conservative assessment about reserves, um, we're going to definitely have fossil fuels, not counting coal, but just the, the easy fossil fuels until 2050, right? And um, coal reserves are probably going to last a couple centuries after that. You saw the earlier plots that put, there was still plenty of coal at the year 2300. Um, and um, less conservative estimates that take into account all the sort of hypothetical reserves and technological increases may extend this out to as much as 2200, the year 2200, as we saw in the last plot. We don't really know how long the carbon is going to last, but I can't emphasize enough that we're not going to run out of carbon anytime soon, certainly before we have to mitigate. So now I want to, the last topic I want to talk about are methane hydrates. And these are really interesting um, materials. Scientifically, they're super cool. So what they are is a combination of water, ice, and methane gas. So they form in certain conditions of pressure and temperature, but it's ice that traps gas in it. And um, you can find them on the seabed in the right pressure and temperature. You can find them in very cold um, polar regions like down in the soil and tundra. You can find them down in sediments and continental shelf environments. These are some pictures of what they look like. And you can, as they melt, they start to produce methane. So you can ignite them and still keep this uh, um, snow in a petri dish. Now I'll tell you that the very first one of these was named after the person who was my master's advisor, who is not a very nice person to work with. And it was named Craigite. His name was Craig because they're unstable at atmospheric temperature and pressure, which was exactly him. Um, but like I say, they are really, they're neat. They're, they're totally neat material, but they have a tendency to exist only under really specific conditions of temperature and pressure. And people have, have always until recently assumed that uh, we're never gonna be able to mine that. If we tried to extract it from a place, it's just gonna decompose could decompose catastrophically and, and cause explosions. Uh, people have implicated methane hydrates in climate change. I have a slide about that near the end. But nevertheless, they're, they're very cool. And there's a ton of methane in here. It swamps the amount that we have in known natural gas reserves and traditional reserves. These are just a few more fun pictures because you know they're fun. So this is um, some pictures of what the structure is. So basically, water, ice, um, that trap methane. So these are little methane tetrahedra, like the carbon with four hydrogens on it, trapped inside. And there's a couple of different structures that occur at different places in the pressure temperature space, but they decompose to make methane. And one of the interesting things about them is most of the occurrences that we have on Earth, we think exist in steady state, that there needs to be methane production beneath it. This is biological methane production by fermentation, um, by microorganisms way down the redox ladder that are taking carbon and using CO2 to oxidize carbon and produce methane. Methane is kind of like percolating up through the sediment or the soil or wherever it is and encounters the right conditions of pressure and temperature where it feeds into the ice and it would convert traditional ice into these hydrate structures. And this is some of the places where we find hydrates on the planet. This is a plot made by the military. This is the Navy plot. The US government has been very interested in these, as have other militaries around the world, because they're really well distributed. So we have places uh, in the continental shelves, when we have places up in the Arctic. What isn't shown on here are too many like, tundra areas. There are a couple up here in um, Russia, our former Soviet Union. And then places where these guys, maybe research lab, is researching this, right? This was like, again, an old, like 20 year old plot. So they exist, they're around, and people have been thinking about them. This is another plot from a Scientific American article. Again, kind of historical. This is from about the year 2000. I've forgotten the year, I should have put it on here. But of known discoveries of methane hydrates around the world that are being utilized or studied for utilization. Right, so there's a whole bunch of places along the west coast. There's this famous place off Oregon called Hydrate Ridge, it's really close to Coops and the shore, where you can find uh, methane hydrates on the seabed. People go down there studying them. There's 
weird chemosynthetic communities, two worms and clams and so forth living on them. Um, there are various discoveries all throughout Central America, discoveries off of um, South America and Africa, but not as much because I don't think people have looked as much. Discoveries here off of Scandinavia, up here off of Russia and within Russia and in Japan. The location of dots on this map is more a reflection of where people have looked, you know, which countries have been interested in this as opposed to the right environments. I'm pretty sure that the environments for these things exist all around South America, all around Africa, all around Australia. It's just that by, at the time this had been written, people hadn't looked. But if you look at this pie chart here, okay, these are again have relative reserve sizes and billions of tons. Here's fossil fuels at 5,000. Here's other, which includes um, um, methane as well as you know all the other resources that that we've already talked about, you know, nuclear, etc. And here's gas hydrates, twice as much as this. So if these were utilizable, again, tons of carbon. If you're if you're thinking about the system of purely from an energy perspective and providing enough energy for the world to keep increasing these energy uses, you say, oh, we totally want to go for this. Problem is when you burn this stuff, you produce CO2. It's not going to mitigate global warming. It is a lot cleaner. It burns at a lower temperature, so we don't make the nitrogen oxides or the sulfur oxides that we talked about. You don't put the mercury in the atmosphere. You don't put the particulate in the atmosphere. So I mean, if you're going to have to keep using fossil fuels, um, then yes, better. The gas hydrates are better, but they're certainly not going to mitigate the CO2. This is just basically that same plot, again, from a slightly different source. This is from NASA, again, showing you uh, it's a few years later. Kind of their source of this information is the same the Naval Research Lab as the last of the diagram two slides ago. Uh, but but more occurrences, the places that were that are being looked at um, and being discussed. And one of the places that you know the, the seabed occurrences are more common, but technologically a little bit more complicated to get at. Whereas the occurrences on land are easier. You know, think about. Um, uh, permafrost regions in the Arctic that are, as climate changes, we're starting to melt back some of that stuff and expose more areas. And in fact, one of the things that people worry about is that as the planet warms, some of the natural deposits in the Arctic region are going to destabilize and put methane into the atmosphere. If you remember when we talked about last time, methane is like 20 times as effective as CO2 at greenhouse gas warming. So whether we utilize it or not, by warming the planet, we may be starting to release a lot of uh, methane from hydrates as they decompose. So the phase diagram of these things is, is kind of complicated because um, it's a little bit different if we have sodium chloride in our water than if we have pure water. So this is a phase diagram that's got temperature and depth, and it's got a couple of different uh, curves on here. It's got like the ice water phase boundary. Um, and this is within um, sodium chloride. Uh, water, salt water of the amount that is um, seawater, and then various other um, zones like th this thing here. It says a hydrate gas phase boundary, meaning that if the temperature gets above about 30 degrees C at um, really high pressure, then water ice, the methane ice, will transform, the hydrate, I should say, should transform into a gas. And then when we go down to lesser and lesser depth or lower and lower pressure, it takes less temperature to make it decompose. So that, um, you know, at much lower pressures, um, you know, this will happen at closer to zero degrees C. And this doesn't even go up to um, this depth of meters in the ocean. That's still 100 meters depth. This isn't continued up to the surface because we tend to not find these things on the surface. So you can make similar diagrams like this using the lithostatic pressure for terrestrial deposits that occur on land, but this is a marine deposit. And this is sort of how that translates into uh, take a spot in the ocean. And we, we know that there's like a typical temperature variation with depth, both in the ocean and once we get into the sediment, something called the geothermal gradient. Temperatures increase as we go down. Not everywhere have exactly the same gradient, but um, there is a zone of stability of hydrates, which includes the shallower parts of sediments and the deeper parts of the oceans. And so this is why sometimes we find these things occurring on seabed, not decomposing like the um, hydrate ridge uh, locations. Um, and interestingly enough, 
we get hydrate in sediments, but below them, you can see here, zona free gas. So this is what I was talking about with the redox ladder transformations. We got to make the gas and percolate it up, and then it intersects the zone where these things are produced. And so one of the main ways this is recognized is through um, seismology, um, combined with some amount of drilling, recovery of samples, and chemistry to kind of confirm things, especially what we call pore water chemistry, which is the water in between the particles of sediments. One of the key parts of this are something called ESRs, which are basically seismic reflections of the base of these deposits, where the ice is the deepest occurrence of the ice. And so seismic energy is really good at looking at changes in the density of stuff as you go down with depth. And so that lower interface can be commonly found. This is just an example of one site. These are three different drill cores, 994, 995, and 997. This is the seismic energy propagated off the seabed, various kinds of reflections in the shallow sediments. And then deeper down, you start to get these BSR layers, which um, were interpreted to be the location where uh, was the base of the hydrate zone. But you can go in there and start to do chemistry and figure out, um, you know, yes, or is, is, is this a location where we expect the hydrates to be formed? And one of the things that's interesting, like, so these are chlorinity. And one of the things that happens when you start to make ice, you exclude chloride. So in zones where there's a lot of ice, the chloride should go up. And so all of these things at the location of the BSR, the chloride goes up and then it goes down and we go deeper. So down mean, means that we haven't created the ice. We still have a, a saltier seawater um, and then, or a less salty seawater. I should say. And as we start to make the methane ice, the seawater becomes saltier. So the chlorinity goes up. There's other indicators as well. Um, so this is basically at one of those three sites, you can going down with depth again, you, you're looking at methane on this axis increasing and sulfate on that axis. And one of the things we see is that the sulfate goes down, right? Sulfate goes down because of our redox ladder reactions of sulfate going to sulfide. That's pretty far down the redox ladder. Um, the only main dominant reaction after that is the production of methane by using CO2 as the oxidant. And you can see that the methane doesn't start to increase until we've consumed all the sulfur. Because it's different microorganisms that are doing that consumption. But we'll see this big peak in methane and it drops off again. And the big peak corresponds to the place where the chlorinity has also gone up in the pore water is where the ice is being formed, right? We're, we're starting to produce the methane and then it starts to dissolve in the ice. And so the concentration left in the pore water goes down again. And, um, you know, people have thought about, well, you know, are these city state deposits or if we stop the supply of methane where they continue to form? And the presumption is, is that there's always a small amount of degradation of hydrate at the top and a small amount of production at the bottom. And you need to be feeding in more methane pretty much all the time. So you have to have organic rich sediments, really low redox conditions, CO2 fermentation going on so that we're breaking down organic matter, making methane and sort of feeding these things. That's all happening in the zone below the PSR where, where we don't have the hydrates from. So in terms of exploitation, people have talked about various things. Um, you know, one thing would be to use uh, something like a drill ship um, that basically um, injects um, things down into the seabed, decomposes a small amount of hydrate and sucks it back up. Some of that is kind of conceptually shown here, where you're basically pumping in CO2 to pressurize the reservoir, you're pumping in salt water, and you're kind of locally decomposing hydrate and pulling out methane. And the big question is whether or not this can be done without causing like catastrophic blowouts and changes to the seabed and um, perhaps even explosions. It's just not well known. This is the equivalent system on land in like a tundra area. We are basically doing the same thing. You're injecting various things to destabilize a small amount of hydrate and quickly suck it back up. And I think this is working at the test level, but not at the full exploitation level. This is an example of a rig um, that um, the US Geological Survey, along with the US the Geological Survey of Canada and a Japanese um, oil company, are all working together in Canada on a sort of a test site. There's a small, small site here where they're doing this kind of thing. So it's, it's possible it exists. Whether or not they'll start exploiting it, I don't know. This is a um, 
just something I just wanted to mention here at the end, which is that so gas hydrates exist within um, the sediment, both um, below sea level and above sea level, like in tundra regions and so forth. And this is a scenario that says, oh, well, what if sea level rises, like at the end of the last ice age? Remember, we looked at how the gases change and we looked at the methane and the CO2 increase and the insulation. And we come out of glacials much faster than we go into glacials. And one of the hypothesized scenarios is catastrophic release of methane from rapid sea level rise, putting many of the deposits into a zone of pressure and temperature where it destabilizes methane. There was actually even a hypothesis about 15 years ago called the methane gun hypothesis that presumed that a huge amount of methane was released at uh, the end of the last ice age and it caused also a catastrophic um, landsliding on the Atlantic Ocean and tsunamis like 10,000 years ago. The problem is, is that we don't find the geochemical evidence for that. People have looked for the methane pulses. And we know that this methane, for instance, has a different carbon 12, carbon 13 isotopic composition, even after it's oxidized to CO2, it has a very biogenic signature, which means a lot of 12 and very little 13. And we don't see that in the natural system. We don't see it in sediments of the time uh, or any other deposits that have um, carbon in it. So hypothetically, this could happen, and this could happen again as we're going into the sort of new regime on the planet where it's a lot warmer and sea level might be rising a lot higher than it's been in the last couple million years. So it's something to, to be aware of and to think about, but we don't actually know that this will happen. And the one time in the past that it was hypothesized to occur, when people started to look at it in detail, they haven't found any evidence for it. I'm pretty sure that's it, yeah. So those are hydrocarbon fuels and resources. Are there questions? Nope. Okay.